It was like Boogie Nights meets Days of Thunder. So one of my favorite racing stories of all time, and most people really haven't heard of since they're not geeks like me, are the Whittington brothers. Now the Whittington brothers were three brothers who were into plane racing and adrenaline junkie stuff in the early 70s. And they decided to become sports car racers, because why not, right? And they went to the 1979 24 Hours of Le Mans and got a seat, two of them, Bill and his brother, got a seat on the Kremer team. And Kremer was building these special Porsche 935s, slightly modified from the factory with their own little tricks, like an air-to-air -air intercooler instead of an air-to-water intercooler like the factory car had, which gave them an extra 2 or 3%, which over 24 hours adds up to something. And they were brilliant. And they used to drive their cars from Germany to the track in France to shake them down, which I would love to have seen that. So the Winning Brothers show up, and I think they bought their seats for like $20,000 each, which was a lot of money then. Like a seat was probably about 10 grand for something, and they didn't care. They go to the first meeting, and Kramer's like, okay, um, Klaus, their driver, he's, he's gonna go first, and then Bill, and then so And they're like, wait, 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 wait. Now, why is your driver going first? Because it's my car, my driver goes first, then you, then you. And I go, what if he crashes? We don't get to drive the car, we spend all the money, because that's racing. And they're like, no. He's like, fine, well, don't drive. And they're like, well, what does it take for us to go first? And lightheartedly, he goes, buy the car. And he was already selling his cars. It was in the, the business was sell, building and selling race cars. So he threw a crazy number at him, like $200,000, which was more than what the car was worth, just to shut him up. And they go, okay. And he's like, what? Like, go back to our trailer, go to the duffel bag, take out $200,000 and not a penny more. And they're like, okay. So they did. And they went to Le Mans in 79. And they won. Um, Klaus Ludwig, who was the, the driver for Kramer, did most of the heavy lifting. And he was brilliant. And this was the first production car to win at Le Mans since 1953 when the, the, the Jags were running. It was unheard of because the Porsche factory 936s are out there and there are prototypes and there's other prototypes out there running, but it rained. So they had something those prototypes didn't have, windshield wipers. And the car was wicked fast in the rain. And they ended up taking it and it was huge, absolutely monstrous. And it was the last production car to win, like a street-based produ production car to win at Le Mans. So Kremer overnight, there's orders for like 12, 14 K3s. And that's what lined up the next year in 80. It was all K3s, like the famous um, K3 that was the Macintosh sponsored car, like the only car ever sponsored by Apple. Um, they were all out there. So the Kremers are on top of the world. So they're like, great, we want a couple more. And Kramer's like, absolutely, whatever you want. They're like, go back to our, back to our trailer, take the rest of the money, and get, we'll have a couple more of these K3s. So they had broad, uh, yeah, an estimate, about a half a million dollars in cash in 1979 to Le Mans. So where did they get this money, right? And that was always the thing. Like, they operated in a whole other realm of the, everybody else. It was found out later, actually, like one of the, the advantages they had at Le Mans was they were fueling what appeared to be faster than everybody else. And all the fuel outlets are regulated, have regulators on them to only flow at a certain speed, so it's equal for all teams. Well, it turns out they gave some guy like $25,000 cash, which was probably his, his entire year's salary, for his stamp. And they took the seal off, and they adjusted it, and they put the stamp on and so they were filling up twice as fast. I don't, I don't know how it happened, it just happened. They were used to working outside the rules and got full into sports car racing. They actually went and got into NASCAR racing and they got into Indy. And a lot of the cars didn't have a lot of sponsorship on them or they had sponsorship that didn't exist. They would make up companies. Like one of the, the funny stories is that they, they got girls with perfume bottles to walk around with a, 
labels on them and spray people in the pits and say, oh, this is the beautiful new perfume. There was no perfume camp, but they put labels on another perfume to make it look like they had a sponsor to kind of people put people aside. And it was just absolutely brilliant. And they did actually really well. They were talented drivers. So they bought Road Atlanta. And Road Atlanta has a special feature from all the tracks in the United States. This, at that point, had the longest straightaway you could get. Now, they also owned a plane company that you could rent their planes. Now, this is all unofficial history, right? So the planes, one over the top of another, would fly in, one would land on the racetrack, and the other one would fly to a local airport, middle of the night, and unload things. Now, there were these trailers in the back, these container trailers. Um, you see them in all the shots of the, the track, and you weren't allowed to go out there or have anything to do with them. They were fill a pot, like just stacked up, supposedly with marijuana. And it was like, uh, they, were, they were running drugs and they're driving cars. It was like boogie nights meets days of thunder. Like it was just, like it should be a movie. Like it was just absolutely brilliant. They get a couple more cars for the run and they, they became these famous yellow 935s that they became. Now the Le Mans winner became one of those cars and it would go to Daytona. And they took the Le Mans car and it set a scorching qualifying time, like almost impossible. And when the car was restored a couple of years ago, the sill was obviously, wasn't damaged, but it had been opened. So they opened up the sill and nothing in there. So they called the original mechanics for advice on how to restore the car. And they're like, oh yeah, you found the hole. Like, okay, say more. And they had put a nitrous bottle inside of a K3. Now a K3 made 750 horsepower, you know, maybe 800, you turn the boost all the way up. So they were going around Daytona on the banking and hitting the boost and they'd have over a thousand horsepower temporarily. And it was quite common, like they, they turn a lap, they turn around in this monster lap and they would just come across the finish line and the car would go and die. And it was it, the engine just melted. It's a $40,000 engine back in the day, right? And, and teams would take care of them. They'd just take it out and they'd have another one, and they'd slam it in and go racing. And there were a couple of teams that did, like Danny and Gaius would burn up the, the Interscope cars. The Interscope was the same way. Now they get another engine, shove it in the back, everything's fine. Such blatant you know, spending, such blatant money that was untraceable. People knew they were rich, but no, not quite why. So it finally, government caught up with them. But it wasn't until after they had one of the greatest indie failures ever. Bill and his brother wanted to go indie racing. The other brother was like, I want to go too. And, like, and he was actually really good. And it, he qualified really well up towards the front. Coming around, they're in the formation lap. They come around three, they come around four. And in Diddy, they wave the flag and everybody jockeys to the start. He loses it. The younger brother loses it. Takes out everybody. It's a huge calamity. It's one of the great indie mess ups. Like in 66, when Dan Gurney had the first Eagle crash and it was like 11, 14 cars crashed, same kind of thing. Just everywhere. And suddenly their name is in the dumps. And Unser comes out and he's ready to punch anybody because he was always ready to punch people. That was kind of the end. That would have been like the perfect end of the movie where everything starts falling apart. They finally got indicted and they, they go to jail. And the Le Mans car gets given to the Indy Museum. That should have been that. And a lot of stuff was divested and sent away. And when they got out of jail, they're like, oh, no, we didn't give the car to the Indy Museum. We loaned it to them. We'd like it back. And the Indy Museum's like, no. And then a decade long legal battle went on and finally the Indian Museum won. But they're still around, you know, and they still have their plane company, um, which had an investigation about three years ago. Again, they're absolutely brilliant, but they were such a shining moment of that 70s, 80s IMSA. And IMSA, the joke is that IMSA at the time stood for International Marijuana Smugglers Association. So they were the epitome of that. And someday they need a movie about their life.